Welcome back to my review of every Pokemon anime series. In this video we're going over the second anime series, Pokemon Advanced Generation. Also known as Ruby and Sapphire in the West, but nobody really calls it that let's be honest. This one is often regarded as the forgettable series and I can't really argue with that. It's unfortunately smack dab in the middle between the iconic original series and the far more praised Diamond and Pearl series. On top of that, it's been a good 13 years since it ended, so it makes sense why it isn't so fresh in our minds. Well, since I've gone and rewatched every single episode, what do I now think? Is the Advanced series truly as forgettable as many say, or is it secretly the most underrated Pokemon series of them all? It's time to find out. Joining me today are my buddies KG Prestige and Tom's Sauce. Greetings everyone, my name is KG Prestige. Hi, I'm Tom, and welcome to the review. Like the original series review, we'll be dissecting the good, the bad, and then wrapping things up with the final verdict. So without further ado, let's get started with our retrospective review of Pokemon Advanced Generation. One of the best things about this series that we gotta mention right away is Ash's experience. This is now Ash's third go around at a region and he's fresh off the Johto League. So from the get go, he's already way more advanced compared to the start of the original series. He's no longer the underdog who's constantly getting shitted on, but is now the seasoned trainer who knows what he's doing and is always ready for the next battle. Even though Ash comes into the Horn region with just Pikachu to start all over, he still proves that he's got a lot of skills. I mean, the fact that he's able to make the top 8 in the Hoenn League with a very limited and restricting team says a lot, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Going back to the start of the series, one of the best ways Ash's increased skill level is shown off is through his relationship with Mei. Since she's new to Pokemon training and has to learn the basics, Ash sort of becomes like a mentor to her. He's been through everything that Mei's going through, so he's the one to help show her the ropes of Pokemon training, and even becomes a role model to Mei when it comes to battling. This was such a great aspect of the series, as it felt like a natural progression of Ash's character. In the original series, Ash was a newbie who constantly got advice from Brock and Misty. But in AG, Ash is the leader of the group, with Brock as side support and Mei as the newbie. And then there's this little shit. And another thing I love about Advanced Ash is the fact that this is really the first series where Ash actually takes training as Pokemon more seriously. We get way more moments and episodes dedicated to Ash training, and this is even the first series where Ash goes out of his way to teach his Pokemon new moves. Probably the most famous example is Trico's Bullet Seed, but there's way other examples too. Swallow's Aerial Ace and Snorunt's Ice Beam are other moves that were taught by Ash. And of course, how could I leave out Pikachu's famous Iron Tail, an iconic move it's stuck with to this day? All of these examples show how much of a better trainer Ash is here, which helped make the Advanced series really enjoyable. And that's not even going into the fact that Ash brings back some of his older Pokemon during the Battle Frontier. That's another big brain move there that really gave him the advantage. But for now, I think it's best if we just focus on the new Ash Pokemon that were introduced in this series as they got the most screen time. I'll let KG talk more about that. Now it's my turn to shine here. We've talked about the story of the boy Satoshi, now let's talk about the Pokemon, their meetings, adventures, and battles throughout the series. Beginning with the regional bird, Talo. Wow, what an introduction. Despite being at such a major disadvantage against Pikachu, this bird Pokemon kept fighting on to the point that Brock had to tell Ash to capture it before things got ugly. From that point onward, I knew I was prepared to see great things come out from this bird. From this bird slamming its wings down to the ground to reposition itself to finish the fight against the shiny swallow, to this bird legit stopping a rolling Dawn fan with its own two feet, and of course, the iconic thunder armor, this regional bird has managed to stand on its own to become, in my honest opinion, the definitive best bird in the entire anime series thus far. Sceptile is another Pokemon to add to that list, making its debut in the series as a Trico alongside its signature twig. This Pokemon began the trend for how starter Pokemon would be treated within Ash's team moving forward. From great development episodes to fantastic gym fights, this Pokemon became an instant fan favorite and thankfully this trend would not stop here as its fights would continue even into the next generation where it truly solidified its position in being one of Ash's true powerhouses within the series. From this point onward, Ash's captures in AG would get very weird as they're Pokemon you wouldn't really expect to see him own. But the question is, just how well were they? 
let's start with Corphish. This crab Pokemon had some memorable battles under its belt. The most memorable one that comes to my mind is the fight against the Battle Frontier boss Tucker where it teamed up with Swellow to combat against an Arcanine and Swampert and of course won. Having a friendly personality and being true to its trainer, Corphish was an effective battler that while small, packed quite a punch. Torkoal... It cried a lot? I mean, it was an emotional Pokemon. Man, I wish I knew what I could say regarding this Pokemon. Really, the only thing I can remember is that it drowned in that one episode. And it lost in a lot of fights. Like, it's adorable at least, so I guess there is that. Glalie. Unfortunately, this Pokemon suffered from appearing so late into the Hoenn Saga and was even oaked before the Battle Frontier arc began, but at least it gave us a few W's during the league. Dawn Fan, originally a fan feed during the late part of Johto, decided it wanted to travel with Ash during the Battle Frontier arc. Thankfully, the Pokemon had matured quite a bit since the last time we encountered it, and when it evolved into a Dawn Fan, its most memorable fight would be the battle against Lucy and her Surviper. Lastly, Apom. Oh god, where do we go with this one? Sadly, Apom suffers from appearing so late, and because this is an AG discussion and not a DP discussion, this is far as that conversation can go. You could call this a bit of a tease for what is to come within the DP saga. Now to talk about the gym battles, where Ash's Pokemon truly got to shine. By the end of the original series, the gym battles started to move in the right direction by giving the gym leaders multiple episodes to flesh out their characters. This trend is pretty much carried over to this series and it's where it becomes a mainstay, so almost every gym battle feels a lot more important because of this. Except Watson. Something else that also contributes to the enjoyment and excitement of gym battles is the battle choreography improvements introduced in this series. There were way more strategies to try out, way more exciting movements and camera angles that weren't really done in the original series, and that all came down to the choreography. It's why Pikachu was given Iron Tail, so its battling could be a lot more unique and flexible and not just use Thundershock. I really like this. Because of this, almost every AG gym battle has at least one memorable element that really makes it stand out. Let's run through the list. Ash vs Roxanne, where Pikachu masters Iron Tail against Nosepass. Ash vs Brawly, where they use the geysers to power up their attacks. Ash vs Watson, where, yeah. Ash vs Flannery, where her strategy involved Yawn. O okay, that wasn't so special either. Ash vs Norman, where Grovel went Super Saiyan against the anti truant slacking. Alright, that's what I'm talking about. Ash vs Winona, where we get Swellow vs Shiny Swellow. Ash vs Tate and Liza, featuring fing <laughs> Thunder Armor. Do not hack like you don't remember Thunder Armor. And finally, Ash vs Juan, where Pikachu flips the living heck out of Milotic to get the win. These are all unique and awesome moments. These probably don't compare to later gyms, but for its time, these were pretty great. And even so, in my opinion, some of these moments truly do hold up to this day, and it's thanks to the reasons I've explained. But alright, I think that's enough focus on the Ash stuff for now. How about we move on to another important character of this series? May is an absolutely delightful companion. Her story has a very clear defined beginning where she doesn't really know what she wants to do. She just wants to get Pokemon as an excuse to explore her world. For a while, they play with the idea of her not really having a goal, and she has to pretend that she's interested in entering the Hoenn League like Ash is. But luckily, that doesn't overstay its welcome for too long, as she reveals that she wants to do contests by episode 16. She's a bit clueless about Pokemon training for a good while, but she gets helped by the rest of the gang and manages to become a solid trainer in her own right. May's also got a load of personality. She has a girly side that they aren't afraid to show. She likes going shopping and she likes looking good. This really separates her from her previous female companion, Misty, who was always shown to be a bit of a tomboy. Another great part about May is that she has rivals that helped her develop as a coordinator, Harley and Drew. Harley is more underhanded and scheming, and he really brings out May's naive side at times as she fools for pretending he's learnt his lesson multiple times, which shows a character flaw for her. When she eventually gets over it, they usually have some hilarious interactions. The big one is Drew though. He looks down on May a lot at first, and just sees her as someone to clown on, essentially being her Gary Oak. But you could tell that he could see her potential, and while he is a better coordinator, she keeps growing and growing and he comes to respect her for that. Now May's Torchic is the perfect Pokemon for her, as it reflects her development. It starts out weak and inexperienced, and it gradually grows more and more with confidence, becoming a strong force on its own, and not needing to rely on others as much when it evolves into a Combusken. And on the final day of their journey, when May truly becomes independent of Ash, Combusken evolves into Blaziken, wrapping up both their development, but allowing for greater things in the future. Speaking of the final day of their journey, it had both May and Ash both enter the Terracotta Town contest, which served a fantastic way to show just how far May has come. May and Ash fight completely as equals here. 
May is no longer that clueless person when it comes to raising Pokemon, and for a battle with no stakes, it's surprisingly emotional. You can tell that the battle got very close from the fact that Sceptile's Overgrow and Blaziken's Blaze activated at the same time. It's a perfect way to send off a companion. Overall, May is such a damn solid character. She has fun character quirks and a goal to work towards, so she has very clear growth. Now let's take some time to discuss pacing. Pacing is a very complicated topic. Some fans like it when stories go quick, others enjoy it when the show decides to take their time to allow the story to be more fleshed. So what if I were to tell you that somehow this story manages to do both at the same time? Shocker, I know, but I do believe that this series manages to tell its story perfectly and that mainly is because of the fact that we see our heroes adventure through two separate regions, the Kanto and Hoenn region. And that's not all because for the first time in the main series, we have two major story arcs occurring at the same time. Ash's journey collecting badges and battling strong opponents, whereas with Mei, she began her journey and over time decided to become a coordinator, which led into her story arc focusing on becoming a top coordinator within the world of Pokemon Contest. Due to this structure, episodes were mainly divided into Mei-focused episodes or Ash-focused episodes, which means that one of the biggest issues that plagued the original series, filler episodes, were dramatically reduced by a substantial amount. Thank the heavens for that. Another thing to take note about this change is that despite AG being four years to complete, only three of the four years were used for Hoenn, meaning that the final year in the AG saga would be used for something else. And that something else just happened to be the Battle Frontier arc. With Ash having earned a lot of experience in his time within the Hoenn region, and May understanding more about the world of Pokemon Contest, they both had decided to start their journey anew, but this time in the region of Kanto. With this saga roughly being around 60 episodes, the pacing and storytelling mixed with lots of fan service led to one of the best sagas that this series has ever created. And this is what I meant when I said this series manages to achieve both fast pacing and slow yet fleshed out pacing, Hoenn took its time to establish its world and give Mei an opportunity to grow as a character, and when we moved into Kanto, well, I'll let my guys over here carry that discussion. So, with that said, take it away. Let's talk about the Kanto Grand Festival. The first thing to love about this is that it's Mei getting another shot at her dream. Since the companions tend to leave after the series they're introduced in, the Hoenn Grand Festival could have easily been the end for Mei's story that we see. But much like how Ash gets to take on multiple Pokemon Leagues, we get to see Mei in another Grand Festival. This one mainly focuses on resolving this stage of Mei and Drew's rivalry, from introducing Soul Dad to give exposition about Drew's thoughts, to their climactic battle where Mei has a chance to redeem her whole Grand Festival loss. This would be a satisfying conclusion for Mei and Drew, as Mei finally has a chance to defeat her longest rival. Taking out the Flygon that was trained specifically to defeat her before made this feel like anyone's game, and then Combusken really gave her its all for the battle against Stabsoul, it was an absolutely gruelling match between the two, and we get to see more of what Mei has learnt from Ash as she pulls out Tucker's fusion on fire and water. As Mei had never defeated Drew before, her just etching out that win after time ran out was so satisfying, it's one of the best battles in Advanced. Harley's here too, and he does get a satisfying battle with Mei, but he's not completely sidelined by Mei and Drew's rivalry. His Wigglytuff was such an out-of-the-blue Pokemon, but it managed to be tricky and sort of menacing. The way she defeated it by using its balloon traits against it feels like something that Ash would do. The biggest flaw with this Grand Festival is how it handles Mei's loss. It feels like a footnote after her battle with Drew and Ash's capture of Apom. We skip to there being two minutes on the clock and Mei's points being absolutely decimated. And from a little we do see, Mei looks incredibly amateur. The moment where Mei just breaks down and cries to the rest of the gang afterwards, however, is a beautiful human moment. Overall though, this was a perfect last big arc for Mei to go through. From being the girl who hated Pokemon, to being able to stand up to a powerful coordinator, her growth as a trainer was perfectly highlighted here, and was an incredibly well-written story. Next point is the Kanto Battle Frontier. It's a fantastic addition to the series, and it's a huge step up from the Hoenn League. After losing to a f Meowth, this almost felt like a redemption for Ash as now he's facing trainers that are far more stronger. I mean, his first match is against Nolan who uses an Articuno, so you know they weren't playing around. Each Frontier Brain had their own style and gimmick that really put Ash to the test. Whether it was Tucker's double battle performance style, Spencer's nature themed battling, or even Annabelle's telepathic link with her Pokemon, each battle has something unique to bring to the table. 
well, most of them. This isn't even taking into account some of the older Pokemon Ash brings along, which just made the Battle Frontier even better. Unlike the Hoenn League, where Ash intentionally handicapped himself by sticking to his new Pokemon, Ash recognizes that the Battle Frontier is no ordinary challenge and gives it everything he's got. So this is where he brings back some of his Kanto and Johto Pokemon. This was awesome to see. The slight downside to this though is that it causes pretty much all of Hoenn to be tremendously overshadowed in comparison, but if anything, that's just a testament to how greatly executed the Battle Frontier was. Although I mentioned lots of great gym battle moments for Ash, the Battle Frontier's moments are far more memorable and just straight up epic. For starters, there's Charizard taking down Articuno. Like, hello? That's only Ash's first match and it already starts out insane. But then we have other moments like Snorlax using 6 moves to take down Greta's team, Ash's fog strategy to throw off Tucker, whatever the hell he did against Lucy, Sceptile learning Solar Beam in Spencer's battle, Ash returning and immediately calling out Corphish to remove his confusion, Pikachu shutting off the lights in the battle tower, these were all great. And how could I leave out Brandon, Ash's toughest challenge yet? This is the closest thing to a champion Ash has faced at this point in the series, so it makes sense why it took him so many tries. This man used legendaries in all three matches he had against Ash and really pushed him to his limits, but once we got to the final battle, my goodness was it satisfying. And of course, what made it even better was the return of Ash's original Cancel starters. This was a great way to wrap up Ash's character in this series, by not only taking him to the next level, but by also paying tribute to the first series that came before it. The final positive we'd like to touch on is the advanced series transition into Diamond and Pearl. As early as 2004 in Japan, we'd started to see the appearance of Generation 4 Pokemon in the Deoxys movie, but in the next year May would capture a Munchlax for herself. This helped make the transition to Generation 4 more seamless, as we were already slowly getting teased with these newer Pokemon all throughout the series. Throughout Battle Frontier arc in particular, more and more Sinnoh Pokemon started to show up, and even joined the cast, like Brock's Bonsly and James' Mountain Jr., and May's Munchlax got to participate in more contests. But aside from seeing new Pokemon early, we also got some very good setup for the next series story. One that stood out in particular was in episode 181, where Drew has an emotional moment and snaps at May after seeing how far she's come. Ash and Brock talk with Drew after that happens, and here Ash reminisces about his previous rivals and how he's never really questioned their training methods before. This is very clear set up for his story in Diamond and Pearl, where his methods could not be any more different from Pool and how they influence each other. And later on, following Ash and May's most recent defeats, they both end up in a bit of a slump in episode 187. They're both at incredibly low points, and this episode probably sets up both of their next adventures. Ash gets a postcard from Gary in the Sinnoh region, and not only serves as motivation, but also helps Ash learn of this new region. The episode also conveniently has Drew and Harley to help set up May's exit from the series. At this point, she didn't really know what to do, and was even criticised for fighting too much like Ash. Luckily, May's contest battle with Drew in this episode gave her more clarity, and helped her realise she needs to find her own battle style. Here she also finds out that all her rivals are going to the Johto region, so with renewed confidence, May is set up to do what she needs to do after this series. Something else worth mentioning is how Harley wanted Jessie to observe and learn from May. This could have been the reason Jessie took contests a bit more seriously as Jessalina and Sinnoh. Another possible tease we noticed was Brock's future goal of becoming a doctor. In episode 188, the nurse joy at the Pokemon Center becomes sick, so the gang of Professor Oak take over. Here Professor Oak tells Brock that he is a gift for healing. Lastly, there's Ash's final capture of the series, Apom. Having Ash catch it right after witnessing May and Drew's Grand Festival battle was a great way to set up its future interesting contest. And since the next companion just so happens to be a coordinator, it's almost a no-brainer looking back at it that this Pokemon was set up to be Dawn's all the way since AG. All of these elements really help the Advanced series not only have a strong finish, but also have one of the smoothest transitions between two Pokemon series. Just like Advanced after the original series, it makes the Diamond and Pearl series feel like a natural continuation of the story. And there you have it, all of the best aspects from the Advanced series. And now it's time to go over all of the aspects that weren't so great. Right off the bat, I gotta mention the infamous voice acting changes made back in 2006. To be honest, I was debating on whether or not to include this. If you watch Pokemon subbed, this complaint is completely absent, but I decided to bring it up as many fans did grow up watching the dub, so this left a huge impact on the fandom that's felt to this day. When we first got the voice acting change, it was kinda bad, not gonna lie. At first, they just came off as lame imitations of the four kids' voices. Many fans found the voices so bad that they made the switch to watching Japanese or just dropped the anime altogether. It's such a shame as this happened during one of the best Pokemon seasons the anime has ever had, that being the Battle Frontier. The bright side of this though is that the worst of it is only for like the first half of the season as the voices do improve over time, making the dub a lot more enjoyable by the time Diamond and Pearl begins. But still, even with the huge improvements with the English voice acting over the years, to this day people refuse to give the Pokemon anime a chance because of the voice acting changes that happened in AG. 
Okay, and now that we've gone over that point, we can actually get into some of the major flaws the series has no matter what the language you're watching. And for me, one of the biggest is Ash's personality. Now, like I mentioned in the beginning, Ash is way more experienced in this series. It's awesome. But this does come with one little side effect. Ash is extremely cocky in AG. Now, this isn't something that happens all the time, but when Ash has his cocky moments, he can get a bit overboard. It's why he gets his ass handed to by Brawly, Drake, Brandon, and even Gary. The cockiness isn't even the worst part of it, to be honest, as it makes sense for him at this point in the anime. The biggest problem with Ash in Advanced, however, is his impatience for gym battles. Now sure, Ash has always been a bit impatient when it comes to gyms, but in this series, it's honestly the worst in my opinion. In Hoenn, Ash is always in a hurry for the next badge, and rarely cares about nothing else, to the point where he gets upset sometimes when the gang has to make a detour for May's contest. It also doesn't help that most of Ash's cool move teaching moments happen while May's competing in contests. Sure, he might pop back in in the final round, but this just makes Ash look like he doesn't really care about May's stuff. What if she lost early on or something? Contests are supposed to be taken just as serious as gym battles in this series, but it's kinda hard to convince your audience of that when your main character doesn't seem to care that much. And it's not even just with contests. Ash is always kinda butting heads with May. Now it's one thing to be sassy, I mean, who doesn't love sassy Ash, but it's another to come off as a complete jerk. It almost feels like the opposite of his dynamic with Misty, where Ash is the one giving crap to May a lot of the time. That's not to say he's always like this, he's still the cool, lovable Ash, and luckily by the time we get to the battle frontier he does begin to mellow out, and this could be due to the fact that Ash saw May as more of an equal now since she had more experience by this point. But man, did his sassy moments just always rub me the wrong way. It genuinely makes Ash unlikable sometimes. Well, at least it was only sometimes, and he wasn't nearly as annoying as... Max. Introducing a younger child with Max always meant they ran the risk of him being annoying. He immediately makes a bad impression as he acts like a know-it-all and criticizes Ash for losing in the Johto League, and he implies he would have done better himself. In the following episode, Ash has to be one to even sort out Max's bickering of May, so he really wanted to portray Max and May as siblings. He does get some nice moments here and there of May, like when she promised her mother that she'd keep Max safe, and when he's put in danger or is separated from her. But then again, that's more on May. And on the way through Kanto, when Misty is temporarily in the group, she has a moment where she can relate to having older sisters and finding positives in that. The problem, however, is that it just doesn't feel like Max adds much to the group dynamic. He acts as a navigator, but Brock is fully capable of doing that. Diamond and Pearl implies he was inspired by Brock, but I wish we got to see more of that in advance. Another issue with Max is the fact that he doesn't have any Pokemon. They play up the issue of him not being 10 years old so he can't have a Pokemon, which does make nice moments like him leaving the Rolts that he bonded with and promising to come back for it. However, the series undermines it by having kids who are clearly not 10 own Pokemon, such as Marius with his feel, or Nancy and Keith with their Gorbis and Huntail. X and Y would go on to make this issue all the more worse where Clement just catches a Dedene for Bonnie so she can bond with until she can become a trainer herself. So it just makes us wonder why they couldn't do that with Max. Overall, Max felt like an experiment that didn't quite work out. May did not need to have a sibling as they don't do enough with the idea, and he doesn't have enough endearing traits to make him particularly likeable. Any screen time in full-on episodes that were given to Max throughout the series could have honestly been used for developing May further as a trainer, or maybe even be given to Brock. Admittedly, he wasn't as annoying on a rewatch, but he's just not overly likeable and just doesn't feel necessary. You know what, Tom? Now that you brought up Brock, that's something else that should be mentioned. I won't be going too in-depth with this as he pretty much had the same problems he had in the original series, but in my opinion, Brock's even worse in this series since Max kinda takes up half of his job now. Aside from his epic return in the beginning and that one contest he competed in, for the most part, Brock is pretty irrelevant in this series. Alright, next topic. So here I am, on my computer table ready to write a solid script about the magnificent trainers and rivals that Ash has encountered in the Hoenn region, but as I began to write this, I realized something. Where in the world are the rivals at? I mean, sure, there was Tyson and Morrison, but guess what? They were introduced for the League, meaning we had absolutely no time to flesh out the characters or even grow attached to them. The only thing I can remember from this entire League was that Goku's VA for both in Japanese and in English voiced one of the rivals, and a bird managed to stop a rolling elephant and lunged it into the air, and a Meowth with Tim's beating a Pikachu and costing Ash his win. It's unfortunate that this series suffers from this because while it manages to fix many issues that the past saga suffered throughout, it unfortunately forgot one major key factor that makes the league so entertaining to watch, a cast of rivals for Ash. Notice how I said Ash though, because while Ash might be lacking in rivals throughout the Hoenn region, May on the other hand had her story filled with rivals that helped make the fights in the Hoenn region so exciting to watch. 
This series had many opportunities to use characters that they've introduced early into the AG saga and have them be an obstacle for Ash to overcome. And no better example to best fit that category than with the regional champion Steven Stone. So where the heck was he? In the series he was never mentioned to be a champion but rather a powerful trainer. This would have been an interesting opportunity to have made Steven's journey in AG be some form of a prequel to how he converts into a champion and Ash could have been one of the obstacles for him to overcome. However, the only thing that's stopping me from adding rival characters to the overall plot is, well, the story itself. I mean, if you take a look at the episode listing that we got for AG within the Hoenn region, I honestly have no idea where the rivals could be added in the show itself. It could also be due to the fact that maybe the anime staff at the time just didn't know how to write a rival for the now experienced Ash. So instead they put the energy towards the newbie Mei. While I am bummed out that the rivals aren't a thing for Ash in this series, I do believe that they managed to do their best with what they got with the time that they had given this series is doing a first of many. Next up we'd like to bring up the Hoenn Grand Festival. It's not as great as Kanto. The Hoenn Grand Festival actually gets off to a pretty decent start. Mei gets letters from people she's competed against across Holton, and they get her reuniting with Drew and Harley. The main issue with it, however, was just how naive Mei was when it came to Harley. She falls for being told to just use Silverwind at what was the biggest event of her journey so far. Again, she falls for it in the next round too and decides to only use assist with Skitty until she decides mid-performance to switch it up. It just makes Mei seem a little dumb, and she should be better than that, especially since she fell for Harley's good guy act the first time they met. Now after all of this build-up, Mei's battle with Harley ends up being Fine, but not particularly memorable. Mei vs Drew is the main event here, and he's got a new Pokemon, Flygon. This showed just how outclassed Mei is. Her shining moment is Combuscan diving through a flamethrower to sky uppercut Flygon, but he pretty much dominates her in that match. Not the best way to go out. Team Rocket were particularly annoying here too. For the whole Grand Festival, they have this side plot of Pokemon and identity theft. Their first try included James himself disguising as Norman instead of Juan for whatever reason. Let me try to steal ribbons from other coordinators just so Jesse can compete. The only bright side of these side plots is that Ash isn't completely sidelined, and this does eventually lead into SnowRunt's evolution of a Mastery of Ice Beam. But was this Grand Festival really the place for it? Much like the Kanto Grand Festival, this needed another episode. It feels like it builds up Harley a lot as the main antagonist, but then the actual battle with him feels way too fast, because the episode just wants to get to Mei vs Drew, who didn't really have as much build up within the context of the Grand Festival. Having a slower start can work, but then we really only have 3 episodes, so we have to make the time they have actually count. This is the first time that writers have done a league equivalent for a companion, and you can tell that this was a learning experience for them because this was fine but underwhelming. The final negative point we want to touch on is Team Aqua and Team Magma. This was really the first time the Pokemon anime tried to take the evil team seriously and build up to a climactic arc. The problem is that the build up was shit. We're introduced to Team Magma in the second episode, and it's actually a good way to start things off. They shouldn't have to be more serious than Team Rocket, so you know these guys aren't to be messed with. Also, the fact that they were present so early on means that they definitely were building up to something later on. In that episode, Team Magma were so ominous, we didn't know what they were up to, so it just made them a whole lot more interesting. Then we were introduced to Team Aqua, and they were equally as mysterious. Then we see them clash, ooh, even more interesting and mysterious. Then we see them again, and again, still don't understand what they're doing, but we see them again, and what the f- They have Kyogre and Groudon now? You see the problem? Although it was cool to make Team Aqua and Magma be so mysterious and vague at first, the problem is that they stay way too vague throughout the whole series so we don't know what the heck is going on. They don't even have that many episodes so that doesn't help. Now of course if you played the games you know what the plot is leading up to, but the anime does a shit job of portraying that. I shouldn't have to play the games to know what Team Aqua and Magma are up to in the anime. What makes every other evil team arc better is that we actually see them working towards their end goal. The buildup is done pretty well for the most part, or at the very least, we know what they're trying to accomplish. Team Aqua and Magma just kinda show up, steal stuff for some unknown reason, and then boom, legendary Pokemon. When did this happen? And to make things worse, their two-part finale was just not good. Sure, legendaries are battling, but the animation is kinda shit. Pikachu absorbs the blue orb and turns evil for some reason, Archie does the same. Oh by the way, this is the first time we meet the evil team leaders. What an introduction. Lance is here too, which is pretty cool, but why? It would make more sense if the champion of Hoenn was here to save their region, like the games, not the champion of Kanto. Again, where the f*** was Steven Stone? They could've even introduced Wallace here as the champion. Emerald was out by this point, so why did we have to wait till Diamond and Pearl to meet him? 
Team Aqua and Magma were just a mess, man. From poor build-up to poor execution, the anime would have been a lot better, honestly, if they just didn't include them. Alright, and now time for our final verdict of the Advanced series. After going over the good and the bad, what do we ultimately think? Is the Advanced series really underrated? My answer? Extremely. After rewatching this series and talking it out with my two buddies, I realized just how good this series is. I think the reason this series seems so forgettable to some is because after this we get things like Diamond and Pearl, XY, Sun and Moon, even Pokemon Journeys. It's pretty easy to get overshadowed by subsequent series that are each groundbreaking in their own way. But I realized something. A lot of these series that are really popular in the fandom have elements that were inspired and introduced in advance. One of the best things about this series was the introduction of Mei and her involvement with contests. It was great to get a new companion with a different goal that's treated just as important as Ashes. We see this done later on with characters like Dawn, Serena, and Go. This series also introduces a fourth traveling companion with <clears throat> who's a younger sibling to one of the group members. We see this later on with Bonnie and even Parker to some extent. There's a lot of other trends that were introduced in advance, like making Ash a more experienced trainer, teaching his Pokemon new moves, giving gym battles more importance by fleshing out the gym leaders in prior episodes, Ash sticking to his new team for the league, and even giving us evil team marks that are closer to the games. Although it wasn't done so well, it still deserves credit for trying. And maybe the reason future evil team marks are done better is because they learned from this one. Something we didn't touch too much on was Jessie doing contests. She straight up sucks here, but this did allow Team Rocket to be used more interestingly and be less annoying, and this is also what inspires her to do contests in DP and showcases in XY, where she was handled a lot better. And I feel like that's the main takeaway of the Advanced series. Although it might not be as hyped in today's standards, it's still a series that deserves a lot of credit for trying new things and starting trends that we're used to today. It pretty much laid the groundwork for what makes a really solid Pokemon series. So I am telling you, if you haven't given the Advanced series a chance yet, we highly recommend it. I'm sure if you watch it with all of these things in mind, you'll not only find it to be enjoyable, but realize it was secretly a great series all along. Thanks everyone for watching my review of the Advanced series, and special thanks to KG Prestige and Tom for being a part of this project. They helped out a ton. Last but not least, make sure to live your life to the fullest, and I'll see you next week for my review of the Diamond and Pearl anime.